we're good to start. Welcome everyone, uh, good afternoon or good morning. Um, really happy to have you here and uh, we're very excited to hear from our two speakers today. Dan Blairoad is the Chief Tree Planting Officer at IVN and pioneer in the tiny forest movement. I'd say he's responsible for bringing them to Europe since I think 2015. He's going to talk to us today about uh, his experience and insights, um, some of the science of the benefits of tiny forests and uh, outlined on the planting method. We're also joined by Jess Ainley. She is the sustainability manager at the fast growing uh, beverages company Fever Tree. Uh, also a pioneer in her own right, she's responsible for the first tiny forest in uh, to be planted in London. Um, and she will talk to us about the benefits of tiny forests for her colleagues, uh, the company and the local community. My name is Grace, I work at Bain & Company and I'm a participant in the Global Compact Network Netherlands Young Professionals Programme. We are a group of nine professionals from a variety of different companies and organisations with diverse roles. Our task was to activate the sustainable development goals with a project of our choosing over the course of a year. We chose to work on tiny forests because it spoke to our agreed upon why. We wanted to do something that was tangible, impactful, and addresses urgent issues of our time. I'm gonna give you a very brief indication of what's at stake from my perspective in any case. Currently today, more than 1 million species on the planet are facing extinction and approximately half of those species are insects. If we talk about the economic impacts only, approximately up to $577 billion per year is at stake in the crops that require insect pollination. But it's simpler than that. If we don't have pollinating insects, we don't have food. In the Netherlands specifically, the key threats to biodiversity are in order of impact, climate change and severe weather, housing and urbanization, and agro-industrial farming. So essentially, we are the biggest threat to biodiversity. A tiny forest can address in a small way some of these issues and remedy them. So we would really like to keep today interactive. Uh, I'm gonna be asking you the audience questions. Um, and we have a Q&A box, which uh, my colleague Firas will be monitoring. So please feel free to add questions. Um, we will hopefully have a rich discussion after Dan and Jess's presentations. So I'm going to start the first poll. We're going to try and give as much information to IVN about what is it that makes tiny forests attractive, beneficial, and interesting for you. So if you could please let us know, why are you here today? Is it that you would love to have your own tiny forest? Is it that you're just generally interested in biodiversity or sustainability? Are you specifically interested in urban forests or tiny forests? Or are you just generally curious about the concept? There's been lots in the media about tiny forests, whether it's uh, the World Economic Forum, The Guardian, uh, New York Times. So yeah, please just do let us know. It's great to see these come in. Um, I'm gonna wait. I think we have 30 more seconds, but just in case anyone else, looks like it's pretty static now. Thank you so much. Good to know. Um, we can think, we can bear that in mind when we have the discussion also at the end that we make sure that we address concerns specifically around biodiversity or sustainability in general. Perfect. So with that being said, I would like to hand it over to Dan. You are on mute. All right, there I am. Good, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Very excited to be here, to, to be able to uh, tell something about my passion and, uh, and the subject that has uh, controlled my life for, for the past five years, the tiny forest. I'm going to share my slides with you. Remember to check the sound box. All right. 
Um, let me see. Let's get started. Um, so welcome. So this is an image of the of the dream I have for every community, every business, uh, and every school in the world. Their very own tiny forest, a place to connect to nature and to connect to each other. Uh, and I think the dream started about uh, 29 years ago when I was uh, 10 years old. And this is uh, me, 10 years old, in my favorite climbing tree. Uh, but the municipality decided the tree was ca causing inconveniences uh, for, the, for the house that you see in the back. And it was said to be cut down. Um, and that's when my sister, my friends and I, we started an action group and we rebelled against uh, the cutting down of our tree. We wanted to save the tree. Uh, but despite our best efforts, the, the municipality decided to cut our tree down. This, this was a very sad day in my life to, to see it being chopped down to pieces. The tree that, that's called, uh, that we played in so much. Um, but the question, um, uh, I think I found this uh, picture uh, 10 years ago when I was uh, going through old, uh, old stuff, a uh, box full of my old stuff. Uh, and it made me think, why, why do, did I want to save that tree? Uh, because I, I never had any nature lessons in school. Uh, uh, my parents, well, they liked nature, but they were not that interested in it. Um, but I think it was the it, it was the green environment where I grew up. And if you can see on the uh, uh, the the bar going from green to gray on the bottom of my sheet, I grew up on the very left in a very forested area, a village with thirteen hundred people, and nature was all around us. So I think it was very important to me to connect to nature, and that's why love nature and I wanted to protect and restore nature. But unfortunately, things have changed. Since 2016, more than half of the world's population grow up in cities. Uh, and per definition, nature is far away. I, I meet children every week that grow up in cities and don't think the Netherlands has any forests or never visited. So. Uh, this is a big tipping point in our civilization, and urbanization is not not going anywhere. The UN expects seventy uh, by two thousand fifty that seventy percent of the world's population is living inside of cities. And how can we expect an urban population that never visits nature to care about the loss of biodiversity, to care about plastic soup, about climate change? Um, and this is a question that really, really boggled my mind. How can we reconnect? Uh, all these urban kids and all these urban people growing up to nature. Um, well, and, and the answer came from, a, from, a, from an industrial engineer from India. Uh, I saw this TED talk, I think I saw it in 2014, that's seven years ago. Uh, and in this video, Shubendu explains how to convert a parking lot or any patch of barren land into a lush green forest within two or three years. And you don't need a really big area, you just need six parking spots or the, the size of a tennis court. So these are small forests. And I, I loved the idea, a tiny forest, because I thought uh, a forest that size can fit anywhere. It can fit in a schoolyard, in a garden, in, a, in every community. So I reached out. And about a year later, I'm gonna fast forward in time, um, we planted our first tiny forest, and this is what it looked like after planting it. Uh, the picture on the left shows the forest after we've uh, prepared the soil. It was a rich, thick clay soil, so we had to loosen it up a meter deep. We mixed uh, straw and manure uh, through the whole patch uh, to make sure it, it, it was very, uh, it, it had enough air, it had enough water, and good drainage. And after that, we planted 600 saplings of 40 different species in the, in the forest and added the layer of mulch. Uh, well, and as you can see on the right hand side, this is what the forest looked like after the planting day. Um, and in this day, it was, uh, the, it was swarming with media uh, all over Holland. They, they, they came to see what we were doing, this forest the size of a tennis court. It was an instant hit. 
But I was actually quite, uh, well, a bit ashamed of how it looked because it's just a pile of hay with 600 sticks sticking out of it. And we didn't know yet if this method would work. Would it work planting like this so densely, three trees per square meter, so many species on that small patch, would it work? Um, so now I'd like to share a video with you. This is a time-lapse video of the two years of growth in two minutes time. Sit back and enjoy. So after uh, two years, uh, it was a success. The forest grew really, uh, really well and really fast. Uh, and this is a picture taken uh, about two years ago in the tiny forest. The, the uh, trees are about uh, eight to 10 meters high. And right now they're already 13, 14 meters high. So it's developing at an incredible rate. But the question still remains, is uh, a fast growing forest um, a dense fast growing forest, is it good for nature? So to measure the effects, to measure the impact, we had to invite science to join us, to help us to, to make, uh, to, to help us uh, monitor the results. And in 2017, uh, Wageningen University and Research, they started uh, monitoring the tiny forest in Zaanstad for biodiversity. In the first year, in 2017, they discovered 176 different species of animals. And for the past four years, they have been monitoring 11 tiny forests throughout the Netherlands. Um, and they've discovered 636 different species of animals and 298 plant species. And that's excluding the, the trees we plant in the forest. So 934 different species um, found a home in the tiny forest, uh, which, which is quite astounding to me that these patches of nature uh, who are planted in the middle of the city, um, well, they, they become so biodiverse so fast. We do see a difference that the tiny forests that get used a lot by kids for outdoor classes and for playing, they tend to be less biodiverse and uh, the forests that, that are left alone, they tend to do better in terms of biodiversity. Uh, and they also calculated what, how much uh, CO2, how much uh, greenhouse gas will a tiny forest sequester? Well, on average, uh, young for the young forest, they, um, they sequester 127 kgs of CO2 per year. Uh, and this is expected to rise to 250 kgs. If you see the tiny forest in Zaanstad last year is already uh, sequestered 640 kilograms of CO2. Uh, and these are very abstract numbers, but 250 kgs of CO2 per year, that's about a car ride from Amsterdam to Barcelona. That's the amount of carbon you will emit during that drive. So 
one tiny forest can compensate for that. Um, the other effect tiny forest has is um, the, the, uh, it cools the environment down. Uh, so the heat island effect in cities, which is becoming an increasing problem with hotter summers and more stone. Uh, so on a hot summer day, uh, while the street temperature was 40 degrees, the forest soil was 17 degrees. So it's, it's a 23 degrees uh, difference in, in temperature. So these forests can really help to uh, cool the city down. And we'll, we'll probably need a lot of that in the, in the next few decades. Um, and, and the other thing is that because it's a forest, it has a loose forest soil, it's able to prevent rainwater from going to, into sewage systems where they have to be filled because rainwater is very clean and doesn't need to be filtered. And, and sewage systems, especially in the Netherlands, are getting overflowed, but overflowed uh, because we tend to get a lot of rainfall right now in a shorter uh, period of time. So we need to take out stone, plant forests or different vegetation to make sure we retain that water and make sure the groundwater is replenished. So these tiny forests have processed over 6 million liters of rainwater since uh, 2018. Uh, so these are the, the, the scientific data we, we, we now have. Um, we'll keep uh, monitoring the tiny forest and next year there will be a final report about four years of research. Uh, but a tiny forest is not just a biodiverse, lush green forest, it, it's much more than that. Uh, to us, three things are vital in that. And the first of which, it's the Miyawaki planting method. Um, we've written a handbook about it, I'll share a link with you guys so you can read up on the, on the, on the way how to plant it. But there are a few characteristics. We want to pl uh, plant it in a, uh, in a loose, nutritious soil with good drainage, so we need to prepare that soil. There's always three trees per square meter in, in the temperate zone, in, in the tropics that can, can go up to five to six species per square meter, and Miyawaki has even planted nine trees per square meter in, in very hard circumstances. Um, the thing is, we always plant native species. These are the trees that were here, uh, that, that grow here, and that came here without human intervention. And those are the trees best adapted to the circumstances and the trees that insects and biodiversity profit most from. And last but not least is we add a mulch layer to prevent wheat growth, to protect the soil from droughts, to protect the soil from UV radiation because soil life will die uh, when it's uh, exposed to UV uh, sunlight. And it prevents wheat growth, uh, uh, so it helps the trees grow. And as it decomposes, it nourishes the, uh, the, the soil. And the second thing is that a tiny forest is always adopted by a school. The kids plant the forest, they follow lessons in their outdoor classroom and they become the tiny forest rangers who are actually responsible for the maintenance and usage of the forest. And the forest is always initiated by, um, by the local community. We don't want to plant forests where the local community wants no part of it. So we'll only plant a forest where uh, where the community asks us, well, we want to get started on a tiny forest because this way we can make sure that uh, the forest is maintained uh, by the local community, is used by the local community, and it actually serves as a meeting point. So it does not only benefit nature, but it brings neighbors closer together. Very important part, that social aspect of, uh, of the tiny forest. So in 2018, we received a huge boost of a project. We have the National uh, Dutch Postcode Lottery, and they awarded us with enough money to create 100 tiny forests in the Netherlands to do research. Uh, and um, well, uh, and that was about that was three years ago. So let's look at where we are right now. Some some results. What have we uh, What have we done so far? So right now, these are the number of tiny forests that we, we have planted in public spaces. And as you can see, it took, a, uh, it took flight in 2018. So right now we have 126 different tiny forests in public spaces. Uh, and this is without two tiny forests that we've planted in, in business parks and on company grounds. And there's even 60 people who have planted a tiny forest in their backyards. But these are just the forests in public spaces. 
Uh, but the number of forests is not as important to us as the number of people that were involved. And thanks to all the hard work of 12,000 school children, 1,000 local community members and 700 teachers, we've been able to plant these forests and more importantly, use these forests for outdoor lessons and for enjoying nature and just connecting to nature in your own forest. Uh, and we could not have done, uh, could not have planted these forests without uh, our partner municipalities. They played a vital role in this program because they are the landowner and they can help us find the proper locations for our tiny forest. And right now we have partnered up with 50 municipalities. You can actually see them on the map. Uh, I'm particularly proud of the, the, the geographical spread uh, throughout the Netherlands. Uh, so there's small towns, big cities. Um, they, uh, they've helped us with co-funding, finding locations and, and connecting with locals. So, so they've been vital in our success and we'll continue to work with them to green the city. Uh, but apart from these uh, community forests, uh, we had a great deal of people who wanted to take things into their own hands. So after finishing my first tiny forest, I started writing a handbook. This, this was the first version. And I shared all the lessons I had learned from my first tiny forest experience. And two years later and three years later, we updated the handbook to share our learnings and to, to keep people posted. How do you create your own forest? What have we learned? What mistakes have we made that you can learn from? And we even made some online courses, which you can follow on our uh, academy website, <clears throat> some English-based courses and some courses in Dutch on how to create a tiny forest, the tiny forest planting method. And because we were willing to share our knowledge, to, we took this open source approach, we met all kinds of great people, uh, one of which was Karen. And uh, Karen was the first one in 2017 who downloaded our handbook and created her own tiny forest in our backyard. Uh, and the great thing is that Karen has joined our mission. Uh, she, can, she has connected with us. And right now she's already helped 60 people to plant a tiny forest in their backyards. So she's now a trainer showing people how to create tiny forests in your own backyard. Um, and our, our, our project has been rather popular for the past uh, few years. So first it was the Dutch media, but last year we got a lot of international attention. Uh, I think the Guardian, they wrote, uh, wrote an article about the fast growing mini forest springing up in Europe. Um, the World Economic Forum launched a video and an article about the tiny forests that boost biodiversity and fight climate change. And the BBC made a great podcast, uh, an article and a video about uh, people fixing the world and about the tiny forest project. So we're very happy, very proud that these, um, that these media find us and are willing to share our story and spread the word. Um, so these, these are some of the results, some of the things we have done for the past five years. It's, it's been quite the adventure. Uh, my uh, colleague Martin and I, we even wrote a book about it. It's a book in Dutch uh, to, to share the adventure we had. So Tiny Forest, Big Adventure. Uh, it's in stores now. You, you can, if you're Dutch and you want to read it, it's available uh, in, in bookstores. Uh, but what I want to share with you is our plans for the future because we haven't finished yet so what are our big plans for the small forests um well first of all we're going to keep doing what we're doing we're going to plant 100 more tiny forests in public areas together with our partner municipalities with school children with local communities uh and we have an ambition to expand internationally I get a lot of requests from different countries saying well i want to create a tiny forest in my city athens malta Portugal, Germany. So by 2026, in five years time, I want to have one tiny forest done the proper way in every EU country. Uh, and the other thing we are really focusing on right now is taking tiny forests into the business world, uh, creating business forests, uh, a tiny forest uh, to use as an outdoor working space, to use as a place for relaxation, maybe even meditation. And here you can see our first tiny forest uh, for business planted. Um, we uh, took out 22 parking spots and planted a, a 200 square meter forest that's now being used by the employees of the company. 
uh, and we're hoping to connect with a lot of businesses in the, in the next few years to um, to really help to green those business park, increase biodiversity, and increase uh, um, and, uh, work pleasure for for employees and boost their creativity, productivity, uh, and and pride of the company. So if you're interested, uh, please connect to the team at at UN Global Compact, Grace Safaris, and, and we, we can see if we can uh, work something out together. Um, so this was my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening and plant a forest so that the forest may always be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, if you could, yep, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, before we move on to Jess, I'm going to quickly poll the audience once more. Um, with question number two. We would love to understand more deeply what it is that makes the tiny forest attractive for your organization. Is it that you happen to be developing your landscape plans and that an outdoor meeting place is exactly what you want? Is it that you see it as a vehicle for employee engagement? Um, is it that you want to foster better community engagement with your neighbors, with the people around you, with the local school perhaps? Or is it specifically the biodiversity angle that you really feel that your organization needs to contribute positively to improving biodiversity? Is it perhaps something else, one of the, the heat island effects that Dan mentioned? Or do you even see it as a platform for potential business opportunities? Uh, I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds as more votes come in. And I'm gonna, oh, more coming in. Right, I'm gonna stop it now and share the results. Fantastic to see. That's really interesting, that's nice actually. Um, I'm going to stop this and hand it over to Jess who can tell us more about her experience with fever trees, tiny forest. Hi everyone, um, hope you can see my screen. Hopefully Grace, you'll confirm that you can see my slides. Yeah, all good. Um, and thanks Dan, that was a really great um, intro to what is actually a tiny forest. Um, so really quickly, because I know most of you are based in the Netherlands, I wanted to give you a quick intro to Fever Tree. Um, you might not know us, you might not have seen the brand. Um, this image is just a selection um, of our products. So Fever Tree is a premium mixer brand that was founded in the UK um, about 16 years ago by two co-founders as a challenger brand to sort of the mainstream products. Um, and it's grown into the global category leader, selling in over 75 countries globally. This is sort of tonics, ginger, ale, ginger beer, colas, um, all things to mix with your favorite spirits. Um, the brand was founded on the principle of mix with the best. Um, and this was primarily achieved through directly sourcing the best tasting, highest quality, always natural ingredients. So whereas other products used um, sort of synthesized lab, lab based um, ingredients, ours are always natural. Um, and the company is now a publicly traded business on the UK's AIM market valued at 2.7 billion. So you can see that, you know, the company's been really fast growing over the last 15, 16 years. Um, and a really key part of this journey has been figuring out what sustainability really means to us as a brand. Um, so although sustainability has always been considered in key decisions, such as only ever using infinitely recyclable bottles and cans, packaging rather than ever using plastic, um, and working to set up direct relationships with ingredient suppliers around the world, about a year and a half ago, they created a dedicated role to oversee all of the sustainability initiatives um, for the company, which is exactly where I came in. Um, so working with the senior team, I put in place the structure that you can see on this slide to direct what does sustainability mean at Fever Tree. Um, and for us, we've got three brand routes and five branches to guide our initiatives and to ensure everything ladders up to the brand purpose of mix with the best, which we see as extending from being not only the best tasting, best quality products, but also how we do business in a sustainable and ethical way. Um, I'm not going to take you through the full program, but you can see here we've got our three routes 
um, five C's, which are our five branches, um, covering off what you'd expect to see for a sort of global FMCG brand looking at sustainability. Um, there is more information on our website if you're interested in finding out more. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is how Tiny Forest fits into this strategy and, oh, we've gone one too far, um, how Tiny Forest fits into this strategy and sort of how it plays its part in our global sustainability agenda. Um, so we'd already identified urban tree planting as a priority under our conservation branch. And this is because we see supporting conservation, well, I guess it sort of comes from our brand root of our ingredients, so natural ingredients, and we know that our natural ingredients rely on a well-managed and looked after natural environment. And to do that, we believe in conserving the environment. And for us, this conservation is both where we source, but also um, where we source our ingredients, but also where we live and work. So this is where we got to this idea of urban areas. Um, and within that, we were prioritizing urban tree planting. Um, so with this, with this sort of clear idea of urban tree planting, um, we found out, I guess, about tiny forests. Um, and for us, this sort of all came about in a really fortuitous way. Um, so how did we go from learning about tiny forests to actually putting our spades in the ground to plant the trees? Um, so I was lucky enough to have a contact at the local council who already was involved with Earthwatch, your IVM's partner in the UK. Um, and they got in touch to see if we were interested in the initiative because we were already sort of a prominent business headquartered in the borough. Um, for those of you who don't know London, Seaver Trees office is in Hammersmith, which is West London. So we're slightly outside of sort of central London um, and the city where most businesses are located. So the lower number of larger companies located in our borough combined with some interactions with the local council that we'd already had to support um, during the beginning of the COVID pandemic, meant that we already had a contact at the council and was sort of known to them as a proactive and interested local company um, headquartered in the borough. So once they sort of got in touch and said, we're, we're looking at this new initiative with an organization called Earthwatch, it's called Tiny Forest, are you interested? Um, I then got in touch with Earthwatch directly to learn more about what they are, how it all works. Um, and as you've seen from Dan's presentation, I sort of instantly knew this was going to be a really interesting initiative for us to be part of. And it's really in its infancy in the UK. So we can't claim to have um, nearly as many tiny forests as in the Netherlands. But I think that was also one of the really enticing things was that we want you know fever tree is a pioneering brand we were founded as a challenger brand um, and we like to do things first for sure um so for us sort of bringing it to the uk was all part of the appeal um and also we just love the concept that although it's really small the benefits are so much bigger than sort of the sum of its parts um, we like to say it is small but it is mighty um, so we sort of found this project that beautifully aligned with the priorities that we'd already agreed on as a company um, and found sort of the project through Tiny Forest, um, working with Earthwatch and the local council. So practically we had to figure out how we're actually gonna make it work. Um, so for us, the, probably the biggest challenge was to find the right place to plant the Tiny Forest. Um, we do not have our own land. So this was sort of, you know, the, the first thing that we really had to overcome. We, we have a small office. Um, we do have a car park though, so maybe that's our next place to look at. We've got about eight car parking spaces. So now Dan's mentioned we could do it there. Maybe we, maybe that's where we look. But um, what we did do is we had to work with the local council and the local parks department um, to find a suitable plot. And for us, really the proximity to our office was the most important criteria. Um, so our office is actually opposite a local park, and that's where we really wanted to plant the tiny forest. Um, and we worked really hard to find the right space, but it just wasn't possible. So we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, and we found this plot of land, um, which is sort of circled on the map. You can see it's right in the middle of housing. Um, it says television centre. That is no longer. That's all being converted into flats. 
um, there's a big shopping centre um, and actually where we found was it used to be an old bowling green which had been sort of knocked down and left to ruin and it was completely derelict. Um, so we worked with the council to secure the site. We had to sign sort of tripartite contracts and agreements with the council and with Earthwatch. And we put the tiny forest into this plot of land as part of a broader regeneration project with the local council. And in hindsight, actually, this site was much better than the initial site that we were looking at because we brought life back to a derelict plot. It was completely overgrown, lots of litter, lots of weeds, um, and it's right in the middle of our borough. And then for us, really, the next challenge was COVID. Um, so we were due to plant about November time last year. We kept pushing back and back and back. Um, and then finally, we put our spades and seeds uh, in the ground in March. Um, so you can see here, this is sort of what it looked like in the beginning. On the left hand side, you can see the, the tiny forest sort of pitch plotted out. And um, you can see we've got flats, we've got council accommodation um, right in the heart of the city. And this is what we've ended up planting um, in Hammersmith. So um, for us, unfortunately, it meant that we weren't able to have colleagues along on the day as volunteers, which was also really part of the initiative that was so enticing was that, you know, we could get our colleagues along, get their hands dirty, learn about biodiversity in urban areas and conservation. But unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. Um, so what we did was we sort of tried to bring it to life for our colleagues at home. Um, and how we did this was we sent um, wild seeds to everyone at home to plant um, wherever they wanted. Um, and we kept everyone updated through sort of internal newsletter um, and comms. And we've also got a keeper team. So what Dan didn't mention is that something brilliant as part of the Earthwatch um, program is that they set up a keeper team. Um, we've got volunteers on this who are sort of visiting every couple of weeks to make sure that the trees are thriving, that there's no litter or vandalism if they need to pick out weeds or water and, and they're engaged and they're also working alongside local community and local council volunteers, which again, we love as sort of connecting us as a business to our counterparts in our local community, which I think otherwise we, we wouldn't have those connections. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to share with you some of the brilliant press coverage um, across trade and business media that we had. Um, and we also had really great response from our customers. So as a sort of customer facing business, this was really important to us to engage both other brands that we work with and also people that we sell to. Um, so we sort of had really positive reactions and really great interactions. And we're hoping to plant our next Tiny Forest in partnership with one of our customers. Um, so that would be sort of a joint program to have two corporates sponsoring a tiny forest together, um, looking at other urban locations across the UK. Um, so we really do see these benefits so wide ranging from our colleagues and our colleagues um, sort of seeing us as a responsible employer and getting involved and, and something sort of outside of the day job to our council connections and, and working with the local community in the borough to sort of gaining, um, you know, positive uh, relationships with our customers and our, and our um, sort of brand partners. So um, it's all been really positive. And I think doing something that's just sort of so small, but so powerful and, and also just something quite different has really made people think and talk about the initiative. So um, we've had really great feedback. And then finally, I just wanted to share with you. So I actually just took a, I went to my office yesterday, took a really short detour to go and visit the tiny forest um, and wanted to give you. So this is a month in, so you can see, um, I know Dan's time lapse was a bit better, but you can see here, this is what, what we started out with, sort of just, oh gosh, looks like some dirt in the ground with sticks essentially, um, you know, what's going to happen. But actually we've seen even over the first month, some really great progress. You can see these all growing, they're nearly the same height as the fence posts. Um, and we've got these benches in now. So this is sort of, there's a gate and it's gonna be our outdoor classroom. So um, over the summer, we'll be doing some more local engagement events. Um, local school children will also be able to use the site. So far, the focus wasn't around schools, but it still will have that benefit to the local school children. Um, 
and then the broader site is also going to be regenerated so people can sort of picnic alongside the tiny forest in the new part of the park so we've also opened up sort of an extra maybe 10 percent of the park um for local residents which is all really positive um so that's it from me i think um handing back to grace Cool. Thank you so much, Jess. It's really insightful to get a perspective from a company who's already done this project and you're already seeing some of the benefits, despite the COVID restrictions that we're all facing, of course.